you for presenting this new work to us and this series called 2100. So after talking to you, there is one adjective that I think define you really well is time and space traveler. So you explore the world uh, using a computer program called Steril and Sky that provide accurate picture of sky at different time and space. And then you represent this um, landscape in paintings that draw heavily on traditional landscape and abstract art. And I think it's very interesting for us to understand the process you go through when you paint this landscape, because you not only picture a landscape, you also tell us about a moment and people who live at this time and space that you are representing. So I think it will be interesting that you tell us a little bit about past painting you have done, because this series span over a few years. Yep. And so maybe you could introduce us to this um, night sky with a few of your past work at first. OK. Um, so the first exhibition I did was 2020 in Stockholm with this body of work. Um, and in that show, there was a couple of um, different perspectives included. Some that were futuristic. I did one which depicted the view from Stockholm in 100,000 years into the future. Uh, and I did a couple that were more histo historical. Uh, I, the way I kind of used the program has been this. I, I understood that it was possible to to predict or, or kind of calculate what the sky would look like. So I asked astronomers and found out about this program where you basically type in which direct location you're at and which time you're looking at the sky. And you have a period of 100,000 years into the future and 100,000 years back. Uh, we're, mm, that gives you like the possibility of seeing what the sky would look like at certain locations. Um, and in that show in Stockholm, I showed, uh, for example, one, sh one location was there's a place in Australia called Verde Young, which is this, as far as I understand it, like an um, arrangement of stones that you kind of realize is made in order to use as a calendar for, for where summer solstice is and when the, where the equinoxes are. Um, and you can kind of date it to a specific period when people were supposed to be living there and using it. So then I, you can use a different set of calculations to, to predict when the summer solstice was. So then you go, then I could, you know, find a, from the knowledge I had, find out that this is what the sky probably more, most likely looked like or the arrangement of stars at this location at the that time which is uh, the archaeologists said people inhabited the space. Uh, so that gave me the, the kind of possibility of painting realistically a view that was shared by the people who lived there. And that was kind of like a way to time travel and kind of share a moment with or like participate or, or just put myself in the position of the people viewing that sky. Uh, and that has been like, it's the same in the, most of the works. It's like been a way to take a, something very kind of a certain, like the predictions and algorithms of stellar movements that are so minuscule that they won't really change over the course of uh, a couple mm. of thousand years. And you also, when you paint, you place yourself as a viewer, so as a person who look at this sky at this certain time, yeah. and also wonder how they lived, what was the relation to their neighbor, technology challenge they had. So you are really placing yourself in this moment? Yeah, and, and it kind of grows. Uh, but since kind of everything like added or like expanded from the image is like not present in the image, it becomes, you become quite aware of your own kind of construction of meaning. Uh, mm -hmm. But they, they expand, uh, like you, the kind of reason for 
painting them has been this, like I can see the same sky within the program, but it doesn't really give me anything. But the minute it has kind of been painted, it's been kind of filtered through a, some kind of perception, making it into an image where it becomes almost more real, even if mm. it's like, it doesn't have to be my, my perspective. It's, it's like I can look and, and kind of be a viewer of the paintings just like anybody. It, just it's like, like we are. Yeah. And for this exhibition, you choose 2,100. Can you tell us uh, why this time? And also tell us a few locations you have chosen to yeah. represent? So in the show, uh, like the first show, I did this futuristic view of Stockholm 100,000 years from now. And it's so obvious that I'm not going to be there. It's like, even if I you know, keep my fingers crossed for miracles, it's a bit optimistic uh, to, to think that I'll be there. Um, but I wanted to do something which was like, much more closer to the edge of what is possible. Uh, 2100 is like, it's also like a date that figures in media or in, in like, contemporary thoughts, both regarding like climate change, but also like the, like every decade or like turn of a century has a new meaning or like a, a new, like stands for a new chapter somehow. Mm -hmm. um, and it's like the thing which is just out of grasp. It's 78 years now, I'll uh, be suddenly those extra years that, uh, is the difference between me and somebody born like 2003 or something is counts for, for something, making it most likely impossible for me to actually view these. But it's so kind of just out of reach that it's, uh, it felt quite fun to paint. And then I'm like very curious what the world would be like at that time. And it's not so, you know, it's not so mind-blowing as the year 100,000 where a lot can happen. There are so many factors that we, you know, there's, you know, can't even Think begin to, to see the consequences yeah. of anything. Um, but it had this feeling of both being like within grasp and being just out of grasp. And then a lot of the, sh you know, things that we are dealing with now will, mm, Unfold. Yeah, no, yeah, yeah, unfold by then. Uh, also, if you step back historically, like 78 years, it doesn't feel like that long, but mm -hmm. the world was different, uh, quite substantially so. And yeah. also some of the view you could have between the moment you paint them and today already things could change. I mean, yeah. Like yeah, the yeah. world is changing. And yeah, so. very much so. Mm -hmm. yeah, it's It's... And if you put this in relation to sky, you change so slowly, this also bring a very interesting feeling of yeah. time. I mean, it's, I mean, in terms of sky, there's, um, it's, there's no difference between the, like looking at this night sky today, than it will be, you know, seven to eight years from now, uh, the same time and space. If you like, at least if you look on the stars, mm -hmm. the planets might be slightly slightly different, but um, no, it's... Mm. And astronomy, so it's uh, said to be the oldest natural science. It's a field that is very interesting because it was constructed with knowledge from many different cultures and different time. It accumulates to reach what we know today. It's also a field where amateur can bring some knowledge so, for example, amateur astro astronomers have discovered comet, or it's very participative and evaluative. And while you paint, um, you research a lot or hear a lot about this uh, science. And, for example, in one of your paintings, you picture the sky from March. So, what we will see if we are on March, and you have a red dust. So, yeah. you discovered that you will have this red dust covering the sky if you look from March. So can you tell us a few examples of yeah, things but, that you discovered? Or? I, I think you, I mean, it's this balance between just 
finding things out and still being very aware of how little you know and mm -hmm. like leaving a lot to kind of painterly choices rather than you know scientific ones or, or like accurately representing something um, in in relationship to the Mars painting it's one of those very kind of nerdy um, situations where um, the thing that makes Mars red is iron oxide uh, iron oxide is also a pigment that you can use to, to paint uh, so then suddenly you can use and and since, since it's a very dusty planet, the, the, the like atmosphere will be filled with dust, making it a part most, more difficult to see the stars, of course, but also the sky to be slightly reddish. Um, so it, it had this painting, the, the view from Mars, and I've done it twice. One, none of them are in this show, but uh, one is in the series of the, what the, the year of 2100. Um, it, it was kind of fun, this kind of painterly situation when you can use the same material as the actual atmosphere to paint the actual atmosphere. So the, the material of the painting is at the same time what it depicts. Uh, it's a kind of nerdy, uh, but very fun kind of solution to, to a problem. Um, I, mean, I think otherwise every kind of location I you visit or, or choose to paint makes you kind of forced to or like to dig a little bit into that space to see can you actually see this guy if you look east or west or whatever uh, can how you know um, what art historical references would be interesting to kind of quote in, in certain work and so on um, I think one thing that I found out, and, and I'm not at all sure if I got it right, uh, was this thing that, for instance, in, in Australia, the, the traditional cultures used the, the kind of flickering of the stars in order to predict the weather. So since the air up in atmosphere moves uh, quicker or than other, you can see, so if it's Flickering, if I remember correctly, uh, if it's flickering red, it's warmer. If it's flickering blue, it's, it's colder. So then you can predict that the air coming this way is warm or cold, pre then predicting basically what the weather would be like in, say, two weeks. And therefore, you can kind of plan if to sow plants or, or harvest or to move on because the dry season is coming or so on. Um, it's not something really that kind of affected the paintings in the end, but it's like those kind of side knowledge that I'm not at all sure if I depict it correctly, but it's, it's fun. together on the way. Yeah. It was also uh, always the uh, aim to understand star at the beginning, to understand season, for example, to know when the rain will come to grow crops or yeah. to also understand the time of the day, for example, in some culture where the, the prayer was important to happen at certain moment. So this, uh, this kind of example are very interesting yeah. when one look at stars. Yes. And you also say that your painting, for example, who cool seems black, are not using uh, black pigment, but I'm using a lot of different pigments. Yeah. So. Uh, it's even l less black in these because I previously kind of mixed black, like you take green and red or something to, to kind of just mix black. Uh, but in these ones, it's more like the accumulation of layers makes them darker uh, and even like ultramarine, like straight from the tube becomes quite... Um, dark if, if not blackish. Uh, and this brings me maybe to my next question with please. this uh, very interesting dialogue you have with painter or artists that came before you. So we can see a lot of reference in your work to um, work of art, for example, a sky picture at the time and place where a famous painting was done or a color like ultramarine who refer to the yeah. Venetian painter. Can you tell us a little bit about uh, this, maybe an example also? I mean, that, that part of painting or, or like, I kind of 
moving within the field of art history or painting language is like one of the pleasures of doing it. You can kind of be in dialogue with colleagues that lived on the other side of the, the world 15,000 years ago or, you know, something you saw two weeks ago in an exhibition and just kind of just, you know, be quite collegial in things. Uh, it's also like the thing where you suddenly get a chance through the situation and whatever motif you choose to do a type of painting that you didn't expect to do. So the kind of works within this exhibition has been kind of more alluding to romantic painting than ever before. Uh, so there's like, there's a Venetian uh, or an image over there of what this guy will look like seen from Venice uh, in 2100. It was quite fun to make it in ultramarine, which is this color, which to some extent both Titian and Tintoretto and, and Can Canaletto and so on was, at least in my view, was like it's what I saw in their works. They were also very kind of aerial painters or like very like skyward looking paintings. Uh, and the kind of like if you take a canaletto and you slice this into kind of like proportions, it's like a, it's somewhat similar in, in like proportions of sky in relationship to uh, channels and, and islands and houses. Uh, so it's kind of fun to just like visit different types of um, artists and, and you know, so discourses, made, I guess. You also made a painting uh, referring to a piece of Van Gogh and told me yeah. that you really imagine yourself in dialogue with him and place yourself as a viewer. Yeah, but, but that was in the show two years ago. Uh, we know from which window he painted the Starry Night image. Uh, we know through letters to his brother which night he painted it uh, and then it was just to type in and like see the same sky he painted and then repainting that sky was this weird like you know situation when you probably share something you know in a situation share something with somebody uh, and now that happened hundred and whatever years ago mm -hmm. Uh, it was it was fun. It was also I think one of the dis kind of like just personal discoveries in that it was how kind of accurate in some way his painting was. Mm -hmm. uh, that was also like a, kind of a surprise. Uh, it's not accurate in regards to the moon, but in regards to the other, like the proportions and the it's like yeah. Uh, and it, I mean, in terms of like finishing the thought of romanticism, there is like. You know, a couple of, I would call it bricks of the language of romanticism, like uh, ruins and big mountains and islands and, and like so on. And I think there is one of, of what the future sky over Tikal in Guatemala will look like. Uh, and there is Mount Everest. And there is like, so some of these kind of like, really traditional romantic views are in this exhibition, but I guess the kind of content of them are different. In it, you also told me that uh, when you looked into romanticism, you could see a difference between, for example, how romanticism was explored here in Berlin or <laughs> in Sweden, and could yeah. you tell us a little bit about this? No. I, I, recently kind of bought and went, went through the uh, catalogue resume of Munch uh, and it's kind of fun specifically the paintings he did up north it's like um, the difference between kind of German or, or continental romanticism is, is the kind of uh, drama uh, or at least as I see it the, it felt much more opera, opera it's like grandeur of things and so on. And he has the same kind of situation of, you know, somebody viewing or, or contemplating something, but it's like somebody looking at a, you know, the root of a tree in the forest or, or just like something which is like, doesn't carry any significance really. Uh, it was quite fun uh, and very kind of sparse in, in 
uh, and less drama. Uh, one of the paintings that I kind of did for this show that didn't end up in the show uh, was a kind of paraphrase of a Caspar David Friedrich painting. So that's uh, like um, of the monk by the sea of him just looking out over. And there was also kind of like, um, in, yeah, for it. Yeah, very good. I think it's very interesting, or at least for me, when I got to discover more about your work and your way of painting, to see that you really include the viewer, that is you at the first place, and us after, looking at this view. So it's not just a representation, but this interaction between what we look at and ref uh, reflect about this time, this space, this reference that you are speaking, also that maybe we enter in dialogue with some of the painter you are uh, yeah. referring to. And I think uh, one point that could be very interesting to develop or explain is also the fact that you see your painting as constructed image. So it's a sky, a night sky, but in a frame, and there is a lot of detail that are made in the process, trace, marks that are part of the painting and that you don't remove after you are keeping. You also have this raw canvas that surrounds the sky like a window yeah. and a very strong feeling of perspective that maybe you could tell us more about what you like to achieve. With well, this. I think when I, when I got started with like allowing this kind of kind of singular entity hovering on a kind of raw surface. Uh, I, w I wanted to have a perspective that was like somewhat existing between the canvas and the viewer as a like hovering entity and where you, when you interact with it through moving through the room or participating in it, you move from say in the case of these ones a distance seeing them as kind of graphical geometrical shapes towards like the more you, you get closer to it seeing it more and more and as a kind of horizon that engulfs you to a situation where it reveals itself as material, materiality and constructed image where you have all the kind of uh, traces of making the image and, and mistakes in, in painting it and so on. And there's like this just levels of, of um, experiencing it where you and me as a viewer become kind of aware of our own participate, participation in creating meaning. Mm -hmm. um, so I move from like, um, yeah, you know, mm, seeing it as one thing to seeing it as something else and then back and through, forth through um, kind of different modes. But I, I mean, I think one of the kind of important things is the very kind of slow uh, medication uh, or slow working. It's like those dynamite things that you use to break mountain that doesn't explode like over a second, but like you leave it in and two days afterwards the mountain is broken in half. It's, it's like I painted these ones and then on the subway home, it's a little bit like that kind of end um, punch that she does in Kill Bill where, where the guy who receives the punch can walk seven steps before the heart explodes. Uh, and, and sometime like on the subway home, you, you realize you spent your whole day looking at the sky in a world where the present or my day-to-day -day life has, is already history. So there's this situation of like, you know, just perceiving a world where my life and me doing them is already something that has happened. Uh, yeah. And yeah, it's, uh, yeah. I think this is also with your painting, the fact that they are so texturate and that you will see this different layout. So you also say that you paint with minimum free layout. Yeah. Uh, make that if we see it from far or we come closer so we have this body movement we need to to have this different view by moving and seeing this texture or this specific uh, pigment or is this also matter with the light yeah. and that when in the day you see it 
So your picture also has this kind of living differently in time or change. I, I, I hope so. Uh, I hope so. I mean, the times that I've been able to spend longer times with the works, they, the more kind of el elastic they are, or the more time they take, the more capable they are at being interesting over time. So they don't have to be like super interesting immediately, mm -hmm. but they, they, uh, um, they, they completely shift in terms of like direct sunlight and if, if there's like shadow or, or if it's evening or morning or, but they also shift if you're like in a happy mood or if you're a sad mood. <laughs> so, the, and can you tell us uh, why this frame is very important for you around um, your I think your um, I want them to be images, uh, specific created images of certain things. And images has edges that says that they end somewhere. Uh, mm -hmm. Otherwise, it, it would be like a continuum that just continued somewhere else. Uh, I want them to be specific entities that are that has an edge that stops somewhere. And, and this uh, perspective, so this curve, is yeah. a reminder of what we will see in the desert if we look at the horizon, but it's also very inviting in the picture. Yeah, uh, um, that's how I perceive it. I, I think if I were in a desert and tried to kind of like, you know, um, perspectively draw the sky, I, that's kind of the the solution I would come up with. Mm -hmm. uh, the reason for doing it from the beginning was that I did a small work in 2016 that was just like the same shape, but without any stars. And then that I revisited that and did a, big, a couple of big works with, with no stars, but just the same shape and feeling the kind of pull of the, uh, of the shape. Uh, and then Luckily enough, the, the software that I use in astronomy, they, they use the same kind of way of manifesting, looking up, that they, oh, really? uh, mm. they use the same kind of tilt in order to, like, mm. the more you tilt, the more, uh, how do you call it, the curvature becomes much more deep. If they have any question or di direction they want the tool to take, yes, please. Paintings have very easily very material surfaces. Yeah. Basically, you're painting the air, but but at the same time, they have this very uh, they're very textural. Yeah. Yeah. So how do you see the relationship between these paintings and those earlier works? Um, I think all my practice or sure. what like is formulated or comes from a position of trying to. I guess, um, like vainly try to understand what transformation or time is, or or how how we construct meaning in the world, or how we uh, understand our time and being and language and stuff like that. And then I think most of the type of bodies of work that I've done have just different ways of addressing those questions. Uh, and for me, it's just kind of. They are very, even if they look different, it's, it's very, um, very similar. I think in terms of uh, painting the immaterial atmosphere and allowing that to be material, I think that's just, I like it as a painterly solution to, to a problem. Uh, and I like also how, how like negative space in terms of the, the stars makes them into light sources somehow. Uh, it's, it's been quite a fun process to, to paint it. Um, but each, every kind of location and size of painting and you know, manifest different types of problems. So there is no moon in these ones and that's, uh, and there's planets, but they, they, so the planets we see because they have a physical size but, and light but the stars we see because of their lightness. Uh, the moon is too, not too big, but it has, it's, it reads through a different filter. So once, if there would be a big moon on these ones, they kind of 
negate the, st the reading of the stars. So there's like choices of how to crop the image or what like exactly which moment to show because the allowing the moon to be in it would, would like make it less readable as an image. You also told me about the different um, layers so the brush don't have a specific di direction and that mm -hmm. by this you are creating this materiality that is very special. Maybe you could yeah. also say a few I words. Mean, I, I think most paintings in this show has at least the big ones has five layers or something, uh, but I generally tend to paint at least three because when you have two layers, you, you have two things contradicting each other and you see a, a dialectics, which is very kind of like simple. But the minute you have in general like three layers or more, you become, it becomes a surface that carries with it the brush strokes or the air of, I guess, expressionism or something like it, but it behaves much more like waves on a, on water or something like it. It has much more of a fractal situation where the repetition of brush strokes contradicting each other becomes much more like a, a entity or a surface which behaves much more like nature than, than uh, the means of producing it. Um, yeah, very good. But the texture of the canvas compared to this very textured sky is also, I find, really reassuring because it's something we can grasp, it's soft, it's something we see without any cosmetic and then you have this deepness in the star. And it's true that the fact that we see the canvas reappearing under the star yeah. is very interesting that you don't paint them white but you show this texture again. Yeah, I, I think it, I mean, I think one way I think of the paintings is like, I told you earlier, like the map of an uh, earthquake when there's like a Richter scale and there, it's like a sliced onion and there's like different layers when, if you apply it to a painting and seeing that it extends into the room, there are certain layers and levels where it starts operating differently. And when you're like a certain space away, it, it's a, the negative space is perceived as horizon beneath or light sources as the stars and when you get closer it's perceived as canvas again and there's like certain breaking points when it's like flickering between those uh, situations and there's a point when you're far away when it's just an image framed like a very kind of traditional entity um, and then it just has these different layers of operating in space. In this um, this also has to do with the fact that you are trying to create a perspective that is not in the image but outside and this space helps that, help yeah. to bring the painting. I, I hope so. Uh, it's, it's a lot of like the choices, both material and composition, is you try tons of things out. If What would the image look like if you bend the horizon more? What would it look like if it's smaller or if it's expanded, what if, if the image is higher, how do we read it? And then it's not so kind of intellectual in them. Mm -hmm. It's much more kind of like seeing two images next to each other and seeing what works best in mm -hmm. relationship to what I'm after. And uh, feeling. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so, and it changes a lot depending on size of work and, and so on. I mean, in terms of amount of stars, it's we generally, if we were like out in the countryside and it's dark, we are supposed to see between minus two is the super brightest ones and then down to, to six in magnitude. So there's a spectra of the stars that are visible to us. Um, but if I would paint that many of the like light weak ones, uh, the, the paintings would look like much more like Swiss cheese than anything else. Uh, so I kind of made a na more narrow choice in, in these ones. So it's between minus two and 4.5, which is most of the light strong stars that we have. And in the small ones, it's even less in order to you know, avoid the Swiss cheese situation. 
And maybe as a conclusion, because we sit in front of these paintings, yeah. and I think in the whole talk, you could tell us just a few words. About this about one? About this one? Yes. And then, uh, we're I think in, in uh, this one, we're looking east from Male in the Maldives, the main island. Uh, it's uh, before the sun goes up in the east. Uh, and I mean, I think in this show, there's works that both are in relationship to uh, climate change, but also to geopolitical changes areas where you know that um, if you know what that place and situation will be like in 78 years, it's going to say a lot about the world at that time. Um, I think depending on the state of Mali or the Maldives, uh, that will say a lot about how we managed to deal with the time up until then. Mm -hmm. um, if I, I mean, in the last show in Denmark, which this is a kind of a continuation of, where there was a, a kind of sister exhibition, um, I did uh, the view from Taiwan. Uh, I think just if, if you know what it would like to be, be there in 78 years, whatever situation is there and however people spend their lives, that's going to say a lot about our future. Yeah. Yeah. And I think most of these images kind of together build a world where you start, I mean, I think the process of building the world around them is also like this thing where you start with just the sky and then you start adding information and then you expand from the place where you're looking from. So say that we have the Venice one you might, or the, the Berlin one here, which is like both you know, tied to the location we're at, but also to the future of the same location, you start building out from it. So it gives us the possibility of saying like, you know, uh, what happens in the rest of Germany at this point, or what happens with whatever situations we have. At least that's my experience with them. They start, the world that I create looking at them expands and expands depending on how much I add to the image, but always in awareness of my own contribution to the kind of empty image. Of course. All right. <laughs> Thank you. So I think if we have other questions, we can do a tour and speak about the image yeah. with Paul uh, and more in the small groups and so on. But we hope we covered uh, yeah, it, it a was lot fun. of points. Thank yeah, you very it much. Was fun. <laughs> <Very good. laughs> Thank you.